my pleasure and my honor to be here. As mentioned, I am an uh, anesthesiologist by training and an intensivist. I specialize in anesthesia for cardiac surgery, and I specialize in cardiac surgical critical care. And while the discussion that we'll have will be based in cardiac surgical critical care, many of the issues that I will uh, raise in this conversation uh, should be broadly applicable. I have no disclosures, and I'd like to begin with a case. The case is a 70-year-old gentleman with a standard risk factors who ends up in your ICU after he's had an open three-vessel revascularization. And I have three questions for you. One, on what basis do you decide to give this patient fluid? Two, how do you decide, if you do, whether fluid is going to improve this patient's hemodynamics? Increase stroke volume, increase cardiac output, increase cardiac index. Three, a question which we often forget, how do you decide whether fluid is what the patient needs? How do you know whether fluid might not benefit just the patient's hemodynamics, but also the patient him or herself? So let's start with the question of how do you decide whether to give this patient fluid? Typically, what we teach our trainees is that the assessment of the adequacy of tissue perfusion is based on a constellation of factors, clinical variables, laboratory variables, hemodynamic variables. And what you'll notice is usually we cannot hang our hats or base our decision to give fluid on any one of these variables in particular. For example, for patients who come to me in a cardiac surgical ICU, frequently they haven't had their pharmacologic paralysis reversed, and they arrive to me sedated on propofol or dexmedetomidine. Okay. Assessment of urine output is difficult. Many of these patients will have received mannitol or furosemide as part of their intraoperative drug regimen. The hemodynamic data that we use are also complicated. For us, many of these patients arrive paced, either with indwelling permanent pacemakers or temporarily epicardially paced with surgically paced epicardial pacemaking leads. Furthermore, the assessment of what's an adequate blood pressure can be confounded by the fact that surgeons may request for a patient to be uh, kept relatively hypo or hypertensive depending upon the patient's underlying problems and the surgery that he or she underwent. When you look and ask us as a profession, why do we give fluid, you find that there are some common reasons. Among them, we give fluid because we deem patients to be hypotensive. As an aside, a resident or nurse will ask me what blood pressure you want. More often than not, I have absolutely no idea. I don't know what blood pressure a patient needs, and I don't know whether the blood pressure that a patient needs at one point in time in his or resuscitation is going to be the same that he or she will need later. Other reasons that were given for giving fluid include low filling pressures. Again, I'm not commenting on the validity of these, but just what, why people give fluid when asked. And you'll see that the reasons given are sorry, relatively common across basically the spectrum of practitioners in the ICU, regardless of whether these are nurses, trainees, attending physicians, intensivists. Now, when you ask, okay, let's say you're going to give fluid because the patient has low blood pressure, whatever low blood pressure is, on what basis have you decided that fluid is going to be something that's going to improve this patient's hemodynamics? The frightening thing is that in almost 40% to 45% of the case, we haven't even asked that question. In another more than 35%, We've based our decision to give fluids and our decision that this is going to improve a patient's hemodynamic parameters on physiologically problematic variables at best, and only, oops, sorry, and only infrequently, and maybe 20%, have we used so-called dynamic variables to try to predict whether this patient's hemodynamics will improve in response to volume administration. So let's sort of take the second of these, and this is the most common misconception in the ICUs in which I practice, is that there is a simple and straightforward relationship between pressure and volume, between the volume, the status you think a patient has, and the pressure that you transduce. Most of, at least in my ICU, the most common conception is that for patients who have low 
filling pressures. They are relatively hypovolemic. As you give them fluid, those filling pressures increase. The relationship between the two is linear with a slope that's positive. What happens, however, when you do the experiment and you quantify the volume status of patients, plot that on the x-axis, and adjust it for age, gender, body habitus, and then transduce the pressure, the pressures are all over the map. You have patients who are quantifiably hypovolemic, but they have high filling pressures. You have patients who are quantifiably hypervolemic, who have low filling pressures. Why is that the case? Why is there such a complicated relationship between pressure and volume? Well, for one thing, as the Rolling Stone said, you can't always get what you want. What do you want? What you want is a distending pressure, right? In particular, the distending pressure of the pumping chamber of the heart, the left ventricle. It's that distending or transmural pressure that's going to give you some idea about the volume of end diastole, and thus the degree of muscle fiber length and stretch, and thus the force of contraction, and for any given inotropic state of the heart, the stroke volume. But that's not what we measure. We measure, and what we obtain is an intravascular pressure referenced to atmospheric pressure. Why else is this complicated? Another thing, you don't know where a patient's heart at any given time sits on either a compliance or a distensibility relationship. You don't know, for example, if you give a patient a set volume of fluid, whether you'll move that patient by giving him or her 20 cc's of fluid from point A to point B and essentially get a negligible change in filling pressure, or if he or she is on a steeper part of that curve, if you will bump the filling pressure significantly with potentially deleterious consequences for the patient. The other thing that you don't know is you don't know what that distensibility relationship is and when it changes. You don't know, for example, at point starting from point C, if the patient's filling pressures increase to D or E, whether that increase in filling pressure may have been because the patient redistributed volume from a peripheral to a central circulation, or whether that change in filling pressure was associated not with an increase in volume, but with a decrease in volume because the uh, uh, properties of the myocardium changed, for example, in the context of myocardial ischemia. Take another situation of why this is so complicated. Three cases in which you're transducing filling pressures of 20, 20 millimeters of mercury. In the first case, the transmural pressure across the ventricle is perhaps elevated, and in the context of normal compliance, you get normal or perhaps increased interventricular volume. In the second case, with increased extra cardiac pressure, for example, in the context of pericardial effusion and tamponade or excessive PEEP, the distending pressure is lower and with normal compliance, the interventricular volume may be normal or lower. Or the third case in which the transmural pressure is, if anything, slightly elevated, but the heart is stiff, such as may occur with someone with significant diastolic dysfunction for long-standing hypertensive heart disease, or valvular heart disease with severe aortic stenosis, or, hypertensive cardi or sorry, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, with or without obstruction, the interventricular volume in that case may be low. One way of quantifying and comparing the utility of tests, of course, is to create a receiver-operator characteristic curve. In essence, what you're plotting is the true predictive value as a function of the false prediction false positive rate. And what you want from your test is to minimize that false positive rate for any given true positive rate so that your curve rises, steeply, rises as steeply as possible and the area under that curve is as great as possible and approaches one. For a test, however, where you're equally as likely to get a true positive as a false positive, Basically, you get a straight line with a slope of 1 and an area under the curve of 0.5. It's the same thing as flipping a coin. Well, what about our standard static measures of intravascular volume? They're no better than flipping a coin. Okay? So how then do you make a rational, evidence-based decision of whether a patient's hemodynamics will improve when you give him or her fluid? As 
previous speakers have mentioned, we have other options. Some of those are the so-called dynamic indices, pulse pressure variation, stroke volume variation, delta down and the like, observing the interactions between the heart and the lungs over the course of respiratory cycles. The problem with those is using them makes assumptions. And it assumes conditions about the patients that may not apply to a patient, especially to those of us who work in surgical ICUs. When patients come to me, I don't want to keep them intubated, fully mechanically ventilated, and sedated. My goal is to get these patients to proceed toward extubation that, so that for elective patients, we're extubating them within two to four hours of the time they arrive out of the operating room. Furthermore, if you've ever worked in a cardiac surgical ICU, arrhythmias are the norm rather than the exception. The right ventricle is always a challenge. We tend not to have a problem with worrying about the ratio of the heart rate to the respiratory rate. Respiratory compliance is an issue, but it's not infrequent that patients come to us with open chest and supported not only pharmacologically, but mechanically. And when you then say, what fraction or what percentage of the patients who are in your ICU at any given time fulfill all these criteria, it's exceedingly low and probably less than 5%. So you're the medical director of an ICU. You realize that fluid challenge, that assessing volume status and giving fluids is a difficult issue, but it's one that comes up every day and for every patient multiple times in the course of his or her ICU stay. What do you need to try to guide the practitioners in your ICU? What type of test do you need? Well, you need something that's rational and evidence-based. It has to be practical. It has to apply to patients across the spectrum in your ICU from fully intubated and mechanically ventilated to intubated and spontaneously breathing to extubated. And it has to be practical for the resources of your ICU. It doesn't make any sense to institute a protocol where you don't have the logistical resources to support it. So what other things are available that may meet some of these? Well, as you've heard mentioned, there's the passive leg raise. Patient is placed in a semi-recumbent position a baseline set of cardiac stroke volume and thus cardiac output is obtained, typically by transthoracic cardiography. The patient is then placed quickly in a fully recumbent position with the legs elevated, and that measurement is repeated. Volume from the peripheral circulation is redistributed to the central circulation, and you may get an increase in stroke volume and thus cardiac output. It has excellent predictive value. It's widely applicable and requires no exogenous fluid administered. However, it does require a technology that's capable of detecting rapid and often small changes in stroke volume. And it requires practitioners who have the capability to use some of the skills to perform these measurements. In our ICU, historically, our protocol was based on physiologic misconception, if you were. It was based heavily on filling pressures. And when our most recent medical director, one of my colleagues, Dr. Erica Whitwer, who will be speaking to you, I believe, tomorrow, mm -hmm. assumed leadership of our ICU, she looked to change this. And as we considered our options of how are we going to guide the people who work in our ICUs about fluid administration, we said, okay, what about passive leg raise? Again, it's evidence-based, uh, it's applicable to a wide variety of patients, but it, re sorry, it requires technology and skill sets that we don't necessarily have in our ICU at this point in time. It requires the means of, for example, obtaining transthoracic echocardiography measurements at regular intervals, and it requires the practitioners who are able to do that. So what else could we possibly do? When we looked at all the other options and weighed their advantages and disadvantages, their imperfections, we ultimately settled on using a fluid challenge. Now, it was a complicated decision, and even once you've decided to use a fluid challenge, as you gathered from this morning's talks and one of the plenary sessions, 
there are a whole number of other questions that arise. What fluid are you going to give? How much are you going to give it? How quickly are you going to give it? After you give it, before and after you give it, what variable are you going to measure to see if it's changed? When are you going to measure that variable? And what's going to determine whether you've had a positive response, a negative response, or no, or no response? The interesting thing is for institutions where this has been practiced, unfortunately, we give as much fluid regardless of whether that test is positive, negative, or indifferent. So there has to be an educational component for our practitioners. Ultimately, what we settled on is a protocol that looks something like this, and it starts out with, is there evidence of tissue hypoperfusion on the basis of a combination of clinical, laboratory, and hemodynamic data? Next, does that patient have some means of assessing stroke volume and thus cardiac output? Obtain a baseline set of measurements. From those baseline set of measurements, if the patient has issue of tissue hypoperfusion, might there be other reasons than volume that that patient is hypoperfusing? That is, could it be a problem of vascular resistance? And we continue down the decision tree. So to wrap up, to come back to this case and the three questions I ask, how do you decide whether to give fluid? How do you decide whether a patient's hemodynamics will benefit from them? And how do you decide whether a patient himself or herself will benefit regardless of whether his or her, his or her hemodynamics will improve? The purpose of giving fluid, if you're going to give it, should be to increase stroke volume. And the purpose of increasing state stroke volume should be to improve tissue perfusion. Assessing the adequacy of tissue perfusion is difficult at best and requires analysis of a combination of variables. When you look at hemodynamic variables, what's the optimal or appropriate hemodynamic variable for any given patient may not be the same variable that another patient needs and may change over time. When you ask us why we give fluids, most often we give them for things like hypotension, whatever that is, and poor urine output. When we do ask ourselves or ask of our patients, is this patient going to improve with fluid? More often than not, we actually don't ask the question. And when we do ask the question, we base our answer on physiologically problematic tests. And when we do use physiologically appropriate and evidence-based tests, we've forgotten that these tests assume a number of conditions that may not hold for our patients. Finally, even if we think our patients, even if we think we're going to give fluid that it's going to be hemodynamically appropriate for our patients, we often forget to ask, is this what the patient needs? A patient may have be just fine with a mean arterial blood pressure of 55 millimeters of mercury and urine output less than a half a cc per kilo per hour, provided that they have ev evidence of adequate tissue perfusion otherwise. So yes, while they may be fluid responsive and we can increase that person's stroke volume with volume, that doesn't mean that that's what that person needs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan Fox.